church health about five years into my time here after graduating from Rhodes, I went back to UT uh, Memphis and got a master's in epidemiology. And at the time, it was because there wasn't a uh, public health program. You know, University of Memphis has a public health program, but at the time we didn't have it. And I was really interested in public health and program design and program evaluation. So who knew that I would be using the actual epidemiology function of it uh, later on in my career, but you never know. So well prepared. So um, what I uh, have prepared is um, kind of a slide deck that is completely adjustable to whatever y'all care about. So I've told Will to you know, watch the chat and watch for hands going up and fair game to interrupt and ask questions uh, along the way so that this is more of a discussion. Um, really have broken up the talk into kind of three sections around just how has church health as a healthcare um, organization responded in a time of COVID and just kind of sharing our own story of what we've done. Um, how we have responded specifically around the testing in, in kind of giving you a bit of an insider's viewpoint and how we created the testing strategy uh, collaboratively in the city and um, some of the data that is available around COVID. And then kind of just looking at what, what's next for church health. I mean, we certainly created a 10 year vision before COVID hit to take us through the next decade of our time. and. Um, if anything, this has fast-tracked us on that way, on that path. So um, that could be an interesting discussion too. But really just what, whatever um, strikes your fancy and spurs some curiosity, please just raise your hand or throw a question in the chat. We're just plain old interrupt me and um, we'll stop and talk about it. So I think, I think we might actually have a question for you. I'm looking at the chat and Charlotte, okay. did you have a, a question for Jenny already? Oh no, that was earlier, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Let me lower my hand. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Let me see if I can uh, get my screen sharing here in a way that y'all can see. Okay. Great. Is that presentation showing up for y'all? We see yes. it. Okay. Perfect. All right. So um, just you know, I don't want to always assume that everybody knows what church health is and who we are. Um, and so, and we can share this slide deck for members who, who missed this presentation or will you're recording it. So happy to, to share it if this is help is a nice resource slide really of just what we do. Um, in our last fiscal year or calendar year of 2019, you know, we started Back in 1987, seeing 12 patients on the first day, in our last calendar year, we saw uh, almost 19,000 patients in one year. And um, that added up to 62,500 patient encounters across all of our clinics. So we definitely have come a long way since 1987 in our one house at the corner of Peabody and Bellevue. Um, and the scope of services has also grown over the years. So we're not just medical care, although that is the vast majority of, of the clinical operations we do. Um, since moving to Crosstown, we now have a 24 chair dental facility, which uh, is just the largest freestanding one that we know of um, in one location for the underserved. Uh, physical rehabilitation, PT, um, eye care, which we do with Will and his team at SCO in partnership at the Focal Point. Um, and then behavioral health services that we are able to provide. I don't know if any of you have actually been to our teaching kitchen here at Crosstown. That's also pretty, pretty amazing. Of course, you know, talk about a COVID response. I mean, a lot of that stuff had, has been put on hold while we figure out how do we gather in indoor spaces together. But that is at least the foundation of, of who we are. So one of the things that you know, we're most proud of and certainly makes my job easiest at Church Health is that we have an amazing staff. Um, and so when we look at how we responded to COVID, we're fortunate to what we call have a deep bench. Um, and, and it's really the attitude of the staff, you know, why we're here. And so the flexibility and positive attitudes has been the foundation that we were using to 
really not miss a beat when the pandemic hit and when we had to really start pivoting into new directions because we are really there to, there to serve and there to um, meet the needs of our neighbors. So some of the things that we did, and this is common to a lot of different workplaces, but our workplace adjustments, um, obviously masking and cleaning, um, screening stations and temperature checks so that anybody who was entering our space uh, would feel comfortable. And I think that is, as far as workforce management, that has been really the name of the game for me as COO to really keep staff safety kind of our leading edge through all of this. And even in convincing patients who needed to come in and see the doctor, there was great reluctance uh, for folks to, to leave their room or leave their house. And so having these very outwardly visible safety um, functions and really telling people coming to church health is safer than going to the grocery store um, and helping kind of put it in perspective for folks because there's such such a time of fear, especially at the very beginning. And so how do we help encourage our staff and keep them safe and still provide the care that was needed? We also had great support from the community and we were able to feed our staff who came on site. And that's what um, this picture is here, the person who was working our drive-through testing, but able to stop and get a lunch. Um, and obviously making sure we have the right personal protective equipment was critical in providing the clinical care. Um, shifting from allowing walk-in appointments to only scheduled appointments so we could really screen patients and screen people for symptoms and get, get them going to the right doorways uh, based on COVID symptoms um, was, was a big piece of this as well. And of course here at Crosstown we're fortunate enough to have such a large space and with multiple entrances that we could really just redesign the flow of people through our spaces to keep folks safe. Um, so one of the things that we say at Church Health uh, all the time is that you know, we go to where the need is greatest um, and we will adjust to meet whatever need is in front of us and so we did some significant pivots in how we provide our services with COVID uh, the first one being that we became one of the first drive-through testing sites for community members. Uh, there are patients, what we're seeing right now is about half of them are our patients and half are from the community. And the other thing that we have that's pretty unique is completely bilingual um, testing site. And as far as we know, we're the only one in Shelby County that is totally bilingual. Every sign is going to be in English and Spanish. Every station where you have to speak to someone will have an English speaker and a Spanish speaker so that we are able to really provide a seamless experience for our Spanish speaking neighbors. That's been something over the years in the past eight years or so that we've really turned towards is making sure that we were a welcoming healthcare and competent healthcare uh, provider for our Latinx neighbors. And so we have about 45% now of our patients speak Spanish. And we really um, met a need in that community and continue to see that part of our population, patient population grow. The other thing is that, you know, we are a trusted provider and we have, as I showed you at the very beginning, 19,000 people who we saw just last year. And we know that we can't shut our doors. So we had to figure out how can we continue to provide care to our patients, even during the middle of a pandemic. Um, and, and many of our patients have pretty complex issues too that may or may not be able to be um, treated virtually. Uh, but we may not have a choice. So we, this is just kind of a little slide um, montage, if you will, but at the top there, you'll see uh, our physical therapy department figured out how to do virtual PT. And that um, actually is not anything where there's a manual about how to do virtual PT. Uh, our patients, we had to buy some of the little bike pedal things that you can put on the floor and sit in a chair and pedal. Uh, you'll see that at the top there, the patient had some of those therapy bands. And so our physical therapists would zoom in with them and watch them do their PT 
exercises and treatments and, and try to kind of coach them through it virtually. Um, on the far right, we have uh, someone who is receiving nutrition therapy and she is uh, speaking Spanish and our nutritionist doesn't speak Spanish. So you'll see here an example of an interpreter joining in on a Zoom room so that we can make sure we are providing language sensitive um, uh, services. In the middle is our medical director, Susan Nelson. I think medicine was probably the easiest visit to do virtually. Honestly, it was, uh, it was a challenge to get all of our other clinics meeting the needs um, that couldn't wait until you know, we could bring people on site. And one of the interesting things here in, in the bottom left corner is an example of our nutritionist with one of our patients who is actually in her refrigerator showing her nutritionist what she's eating. And so what we have actually found is that our nutrition visits are more effective virtually. Um, she went from having a pretty high no-show rate to almost a 0% no-show rate. And she has found that the conversations with patients are so much more rich and effective if they literally are opening up their pantry door or their refrigerator door and she can see what is in there and they can talk about um, what they are purchasing and what they are eating than just kind of some of the theoretical talk that can happen when you're just looking at food models in a room with the nutritionist. And same thing with our PT. I mean, most of the physical therapy treatment recommendations are two or three times a week. Our patient, we've always struggled with having our patients uh, come on site as often as would be considered best practice. They can't afford it, whether it's financially or they just can't afford to um, be gone from work that much or from their family obligations that much. And so our physical therapists were often kind of compromising with treatment protocols uh, to try to, to match what that patient could afford to do. And what this has allowed us to do with, with figuring out how to do PT virtually is thinking through, okay, can we be more patient-centered? This person has a hard time coming on site, but can we do some virtual supervised kind of PT visits so that they can remain you know, at their workplace or at their home and not have to travel on site for every single visit? And we might actually be able to see better outcomes that way. Um, and so that's one of the things that I have really thought could be ironic that could come out of this pandemic is do we figure out a way to provide patient care that makes it easier for patients to receive the kind of care they want, when they want it, how they want it, and that we actually uh, can do it in a more cost-effective way. We could potentially see more people and even get better outcomes. And you know, the jury's still out on whether that's the case. We still do have quite a bit of folks who are reluctant to uptake technology. Uh, it, as it's feeling like it, it's just as valued of a visit as in person. Uh, and we still have the digital divide. You know, we have patients who don't have access to the internet or don't have access to um, the technology that it would take to do these visits. But it certainly is something that we know as time goes on, more and more people will have access to that. And if anything, the pandemic has just given us a kick in the pants to get going on our path faster. Um, you know, one of the things that Church Health depends on to provide our services is volunteers. And volunteer lay people, of course, like our drive-through our drive -through testing site is almost entirely volunteer run now, but volunteer providers. And um, our specialty clinic that we have on site uh, that's full of specialist consults, most of them retired, they can't come on site and do patient care. They're in a high risk group. Many of them are over 80 even. But we are able to use Zoom rooms, um, we're able to use chart reviews, and this is allowing us to just really rethink how we deliver patient care that might allow us to engage with providers all over the city and not just with um, providers who are seeing patients in, in the traditional way. So we're excited about that, um, more to come with that. Uh, we're really leaning into a project um, starting later in July and it'll last about three months about how do we hardwire in kind of uh, volunteer specialists that could help see our patients no matter where they're located. 
Um, and then the other thing that we know to be true is that on the national level, um, the people who are losing their jobs because of the pandemic, 40% of those are in low income households. The low wage workers are most likely to be the ones losing their jobs on the national level. And what that means um, with, with people who have had kind of secure, even if they were lower wage positions, pretty secure employment for their entire lives, um, we are finding people who are all of a sudden uninsured. They're unemployed and they lost their employer-sponsored coverage and now they're uninsured. And they are now potentially eligible for Medicaid or their children are eligible for Cover Kids, our CHIP program here in Tennessee. Um, or they are eligible for a marketplace plan and they've never had to navigate any of these public options for coverage in their lives. And these are not necessarily easy things to navigate. And how do we position ourselves in that gap? So Church Health, when the Affordable Care Act started, saw through kind of every open enrollment cycle, we learned lessons about how we could do this better. And by after the second cycle, we realized we needed to take this team in our, in our organization that ran the Memphis plan, which is like a um, HMO plan for the uninsured, if you will. It uses our network of volunteers and navigates uninsured people through them. We, we took that team and we got everybody uh, credentialed as insurance agents. That sounds a lot easier than it is. They actually had to study and take the tests and become licensed insurance agents because they needed to be able to give people advice on what options are best for them. We don't establish people for our access to our volunteer network at Church Health unless they don't qualify for any other affordable insurance option that's out there for them. And, and you can make that rule all you want, but you have to have the people who can then help them navigate to those plans and understand what they're eligible for and make good choices about which plan fits their condition. So we are really seeing that um, our Memphis plan team, we call them the HAT team now, healthcare advisory team. They help all of our patients and then they, during open enrollment season, they're busy with just the general public navigating these different public options. We know they're going to be kicked into overdrive right now as people are losing employer sponsored coverage and are all of a sudden uninsured. Um, the other piece with that is we're really going to see a second wave. So the payroll protection program is ending at the end of June. And we've already started to see um, calls from employers who had people covered on their payroll and part of the deal to get um, eligible for the loan uh, forgiveness is that you have to keep everybody on your payroll through the end of June. So we're really watching the beginning of July and seeing what that's going to mean as far as the level of uninsured people in our community and making sure that they know how to access care and they have um, church health along with the other safety net clinics available to them to help them uh, in case they need it. So in Shelby County, um, we know 100,000 people have lost their jobs uh, just due to the coronavirus, the pandemic, and the overwhelming majority of them fall below 200% of the federal poverty line. That's normally that cutoff that you think of when you're thinking of who's eligible for food stamps or other kind of benefits is around that 200%. That means you're making less than $24,000 a year if you're an individual, just to give you an idea of what 200% of the federal poverty level is. So they're eligible for care at Church Health. Um, we are planning for an increase uh, load, if you will, in our urgent care clinic. One thing we've learned over the years is that people do not, people who are uninsured don't just wake up and think they need to go see a doctor today or establish care they wait until they are sick or hurt. And then that's when they establish care. So the way we handle that is by having a walk-in clinic. Uh, you don't have to be established with us, you just have to be sick or hurt today and you have to be uninsured. Um, and so for $40, we treat them for whatever that issue may be. Sometimes it's cancer, um, sometimes it's a broken bone, sometimes it's a cold and there's actually nothing we can do for them. 
Uh, but it's that idea that people who are uninsured and they wake up sick or hurt need a place to go to that day. And as far as we know, um, we are the only safety net clinic that offers that same day access. Now, if they need ongoing chronic care management and our panels are all full for our providers, we have good relationships with the other safety net clinics and we can make sure we're navigating them to a medical home that, that has capacity for new patients and can continue to meet their needs. The other kind of big news flash with COVID, how we've had to pivot is, you know, for forever and ever, we have required that if you're uninsured, you have to work 20 hours a week or more in order to be an established patient at Church Health. Um, and, you know, obviously for this situation that we're in now, we have just indefinitely, um, basically uh, removed that requirement to become an established patient at Church Health. Uh, we, we don't know when this is gonna end and we know that there, are 100,000 people and growing who are now un, unemployed and uninsured, and we don't know when they would be able to um, get employed again. So we've relaxed that requirement as part Jenny? of our COVID response. Jenny, this is Will. Yeah. Um, I just had a question. Are you starting to see more referrals from other providers where people have previously had care um, under their employers, or are you expecting that wave to come after this July 1st deadline where people are starting to refer into your system from where they yeah. maybe previously had care? Right, I mean, we are already starting to see some, like Dr. Morris was telling a story just from last week of a older woman who's been an established professional her whole career, and she was laid off, and she's now uninsured, and her adult children are taking care of her and she never thought she would be in that position. Uh, and there's, you know, we know we can't solve every problem she has. And I think in her situations, most of what she was coming to Dr. Morris for were related to depression and anxiety, you know, just the physical manifestation of, of uh, symptoms related to depression and anxiety. Um, but we have found that by, by being able to just be a source of comfort, that if you do get sick, if you do get hurt, we're here for you. That certainly helps relieve that. So, yes, we, we have started to see that trickle in. We have not seen um, a tidal wave, if you will. I think that's going to happen um, as people have been postponing chronic care or chronic issues and they end up, it ends up catching up with them and they need to seek care. Um, we, you know, we hear of all the time people who have blood pressure medication and they split the pills in half or they're um, trying to make them last and that will only work for so long. Um, so we are working kind of proactively with the safety net group, which we're getting ready to talk about collaborative efforts and this is good timing for this. All the safety net clinics uh, who are, either federally funded or charitable clinics like Church Health came together at the very beginning of this crisis to um, work on testing access for the underserved. But that group can also collaborate with what we know is coming, which is this need for primary care for this now much larger uninsured population in Shelby County. And how do we work together to uh, make sure that we're meeting their needs and referring patients to each other for care. Um, just as an example, we have an x-ray machine. And so Christ Community, which is the largest FQHC in town, will send their uninsured patients to us to get x-rays. Um, so we're really trying to kind of work together with, well, what are the resources we have? There's no reason that all of us need to have an x-ray machine. They're very expensive. <laughs> but, and if we have capacity, which we do, we can be the x-ray provider for the uninsured that are being seen by safety net clinics and um, be able to give results back to those doctors. So, um, so collaborating among clinics has, has, already, has always been what we do. It's been a great foundation. If y'all have been watching Dr. Householder's um, announcements and public, uh, public addresses on the noon, the noon news addresses, um, she's mentioned over and over again the strong safety net that we have here in Shelby County. And that's part of what um, she's speaking to is the clinics that have come together. Uh, she's also speaking about MIFA and YMCA and all these organizations that have really stepped up to the plate 
during this time to meet the needs of our um, of our neighbors. The other way that we have been really kind of leading some collaborative efforts with COVID is Dr. Mar Morris and our faith community engagement team have pulled together um, clergy of all faiths. And I don't know if y'all were able to see the PSA that went out um, about masking and trying to encourage um, people to mask, but also that uh, churches are not gonna gather in person again. And having faith leaders from really well-known faith institutions and all different kinds of faith institutions all being together in that messaging and that PSA ran for quite some time um, to try to kind of uh, get, remind everyone to be patient and, and that we have all the faith leaders kind of locking arms together to not start services, in-person services again. Um, we've also been giving them a lot of resources. How do you do funerals? How do you do weddings? How do you um, safely, or even just the technology aspects and some tips and tricks around how to continue in, um, virtual worship, try to make it as easy as possible for faith communities to pivot. Okay, so I'm going to dig in to the specifics around the Shelby County COVID response now. I don't, um, I'll pause just for a minute if there's any questions specific to church health and what we did. Um, one thing that I didn't mention Again, talking about that deep bench we have, but it's kind of fun to talk about as well. We have a really large dental staff and a, a small eye clinic staff, but they weren't able to really see patients in person um, when COVID first hit. And so we sent our managers and directors of those clinics along with their entire team. And we just said, figure it out. How do you do employee screenings? and patient screenings, and how do you do drive-through testing? And so we had our eye clinic and our dental clinic um, completely create these entire new service lines, if you will, at Church Health. Um, and it, it, was a really, it was a really fun thing to see, and it really helped these clinics that often operate in silos work alongside our medical team and, and get to know each other as individuals, and we know that that's gonna help with our long-term strategies for integrating care across all of our clinics. Okay, so digging into the um, COVID task force. So a lot of collaboration happening. Um, collaboration, what I already talked about among the safety net clinics. And my role, uh, Scott Morris, shortly into the pandemic of Shelby County, voluntold me to the, um, gave me away to the county and the city leadership. And I was assigned to stand up the community testing sites. Um, now, thankfully, we have a strong safety net, so really, I often joke it's like herding cats or keeping the frogs in the wheelbarrow, but that's, that's kind of what it was like, you know, willing group, but how do we make sure that we are using our resources that we have as wisely as possible? And one of the things that I'm most proud about that we did, because we built our community testing strategy on top of our safety net clinics, is we really stayed focused the entire time of starting first where the need is greatest. And um, that I think is a, a difference maker for how we approach testing. It didn't happen first in the suburbs. Um, it happened first in our areas where we had the greatest need. So I'm just gonna kind of pull back the hood a little bit and take y'all through what that looked like. So first of all, um, you know, understanding why testing is so important is it's really the foundation to any community response on COVID. Um, if you don't have enough testing, you're not going to identify the cases. And if you're only looking at testing as far as sheer numbers, that's not good enough either. You need to make sure you geographically are spread throughout the county, that you are positioned um, where the testing rates are low, um, or that you're positioned where the infection rate is high. Um, and so we developed a system to help us really be smart about how we set up our testing strategy. But this may be all old news to you, but I think it's helpful to just remind us that um, the, the steps in controlling COVID was first to have a strong foundation of testing that was equitable and widely distributed across our county, identify those cases, 
And then, we're, then when you hear the words contact tracing, they're talking about this entire process here. And this is how we prevent new cases. You're isolating people who are positive for COVID, you're identifying who they have been in contact with, and you're quarantining those people. Um, currently, right now, our health department is at a 73% closure rate, which isn't good enough. Um, this is why they are hiring 140 contact tracers. We want to be really more like 90% to really control the spread. Um, our first step is we're trying to get to 80%. We were right at 80%, and then we went into phase two. And the level of cases that we are seeing in our community is just overwhelming the contact tracing staffing that is in place now. So they are getting them onboarded and getting them hired and um, really trying to ramp up that functionality because that's going to be key to um, controlling uh, new cases from happening. But, um, you know, Shelby County, we joke that we're not used to being number one in anything. And uh, Tennessee certainly isn't used to being number one in anything. But Shelby County is actually um, leading the state in testing. Um, Tennessee is testing, I mean, the US is testing at about a 5.4% rate. Um, Tennessee is at 6.3% and Shelby County is at 8.1%. Um, so that is something that we are really proud of. Uh, it does show that our effort has paid off. And um, I'm trying to move my little thing around so I can see my, oops, my last piece there. There we go. Um, Shelby County to date, we've done 110,000 tests, uh, COVID tests. And to compare, you know how we'd like to always compare ourselves to Nashville. Um, Nashville has only done 82,000 tests. So we have beaten Nashville at the testing game so far. Uh, we like to do that. Um, and so that, it, again, while I know there, there's, there's, and for good reasons, nervousness about the current um, rate that the infection is still spreading in our community, it is not for lack of testing. And so that we can be grateful for. Jenny? So the way we went about doing this um, in approaching, how do you create this entire strategy and also still make sure you're going where the need is greatest, which is what Church Health and all the safety net clinics um, really wanted to do is make sure that we were staying true to our mission and serving our patients and our constituents first. Um, and so we were looking at where there's testing need, where there's case density, and where there's social vulnerability. So every two weeks, we get data from the health department. Um, this is a, a example of what that looks like. So by zip code, we are getting information about the testing rate. Um, and so the darkest areas here are where we have the highest testing rate, the most testing happening, and the lightest areas are the least amount of testing. And so you'll see on the side there, we, we then assign a priority score. Um, so we're giving a basically a rank order based on um, where there's the most testing need. So the lighter shaded areas would be given a score of four. And the darkest shaded areas would be given a score of one. And that way we're rank ordering them by testing rate. And then we get a same map, but this time it's color coded by case rate. Mm -hmm. Where do we see the most cases in Shelby County? Where is the infection highest, the infection rate highest? Um, and do the same thing. The darkest area is gonna be the highest rate of infection. So that would get the score of four and the lightest area is the lowest rate of infection. So that gets a score of one. And then finally, we take a um, poverty index and, and we, this one is a social vulnerability index from the University of Memphis, but it's basically a proxy for poverty. And we just kind of area. Two or one. Them. Uh, what is their testing rate? How, how much is their need for testing in that area? What is their case density rate? What's their social, ven social vulnerability rate? Multiply it all together, and that gives us their prioritization score. And then we rank order. 
So we're able, this is our most recent um, prioritization matrix. So we're able to in the, right along the Mississippi line is where our greatest need is. Um, Millington is on that list because their testing rate is so low. So we don't know if we can trust their case density rate because there haven't been enough tests for that population size to really feel confident that we understand what the spread is for that community. So we actually have about three or four testing events scheduled in Millington over the next couple of weeks um, in order to uh, try to ramp up testing there. So we're really proud of, of this priority matrix and it was a way to kind of hardwire in, making sure we serve the most vulnerable first. Um, and this actually has been shared across the state as a strategy that um, health departments can use to uh, give direction to the people who are doing testing and to try to be as flexible as possible and let the data inform how we continue to, to move testing to where the need is the most needed. So are there any questions about all that? Jenny? Yeah. Um, I do have a question that, um, well, first a comment, I think this priority matrix is awesome because I know I've read news pieces uh, from, from across the country where there were co uh, complaints about the testing sites not being centered or apparently or located in areas of need like you've so intentionally sought. Um, this is backing up a little bit to a previous statement you made though regarding the move to phase two and how you saw a, a jump in cases. Um, can you speak a little bit to the, if, if you're able, if you're comfortable or able doing so, can you speak to the decision-making process by which we made that move from phase one to phase two, considering that we didn't seem to be make, meeting the marks that were being set. And now they are, you know, keeping us from entering phase three appropriately, it seems, because the numbers continue, the case numbers continue to, to go up. Yeah. Yeah, so I can, I mean, so from moving from phase one to phase two, there's multiple indicators that um, the back to business group was watching. Uh, testing was one of them. So uh, what we were charged to do is to make sure that we um, never fell below 750 tests available per day. Um, so we're well above that. Um, we're well above a thousand tests available a day. Now, not everybody's utilizing them. Our utilization rate is around 40%. Uh, so getting people to actually go get a test, of course, is, is the challenge. So testing is pretty much taking care of the, the, the ability to do contact um, tracing is I think one of our biggest issues with moving into phase three. And so there's a real big push for the health department to finish those hires and to get their contact tracing um, percentage and their closed cases up above 80%. Um, so that's one thing that is actively being worked on and trying to improve so we can continue on the back to business framework. As far as the case rates go um, in the new cases, we were um, actually pretty steady. Um, it wasn't dipping, but it was kind of uh, evened out, and that is why we moved to phase two. Um, phase two, we were expecting an increase of cases, um, but I think what, what is happening is that um, you have multiple issues going on, but in general, the psychology behind it, right? Like, I think while well, well, moving from phase one to phase two allows certain businesses to open and certain services, like we can all get our hair cut again, you still have to mask and you gotta wash hands and you have to stay six feet away. And the psych that requires human psychology to understand that your behaviors can't actually change. All it means is you can go get a haircut but you and your barber still have to have masks on. Um, and I think that is what we are now working on messaging back in is, is, is a lot of that. Um, the other challenge is we have just got a lot of household spread. Um, Memphis has a lot of big families. A lot of the culture in Memphis is around being with your family and big family gatherings. 
and really from Memorial Day, Mother's Day to Memorial Day, and then summer, it's just been, I think, the, the gathering of people in the household spread has been where we've seen that the epidemic is spreading the most. Not so much workplace settings, although that still can be an issue, but really more in those informal gatherings. Um, so those are the things that we're watching. The thing we watch the most is hospitalizations, uh, access to acute beds, access to ICU beds, and access to ventilators. And I think that's the other thing that um, has been hard for the general public to grasp, is that a lot of the safer at home measures are meant to slow the spread long enough so our healthcare system can build up its capacity. Um, and so if you then don't continue to practice the measures that will keep yourself and your family safe, all we are doing as, as a community is making sure we'll have a ventilator for you. You know, and that's, I think that's, again, it's the human psychology of it is we're trying to build the healthcare capacity so we can respond to the demand in the emergency department that's going to come if um, people do not practice the um, personal behaviors that will keep them safe. So I don't know if that answered your question, but, um, and we're still at a pretty good hospital capacity. We're still um, in status green or status yellow in some situations, um, and the hospitals haven't triggered their own surge capacity changes where they can bring in more beds. And then we have our altern alternative care facility in the old commercial appeal building. Um, which we're not close to right now triggering opening that up because we still have pretty good capacity within our hospitals. But just to skip through some of our Shelby County data that I find most interesting when we're looking at it from a population level. I have a question before you go to your, leave your last chart. Sure. Yeah. Does that mean that the other zip codes in the city or in the county are okay? They've all been tested and they rank below the ones that are listed here, or is this just a separate chart you're showing us? Oh, um, it's, I ran out of room, but yeah, they, we've got them all covered on here. How, yeah. how are the other zip codes doing? They're, um, so if we go back up, like this would be case rate, which to me is the most, this is probably the one you're most interested in. Is the positive the cases you're talking about, right? Positive cases? Yeah, these are positive okay. cases. So a case is a positive COVID test. Um, and I caution, and again, even Dr. Sweat, who's our chief epidemiologist, cautioned this morning when we were reviewing these, um, even in the light areas, you still have a pretty significant spread of COVID in the community. So it's all just relative. Um, so 38118 is the highest hotspot for spread in our community, but it's, in, it's, it's relative, right? It doesn't mean that there's not COVID anywhere else. Um, we have COVID well throughout the rest of our county. Um, it's just kind of more about where it's concentrating the most. So that you see that track right up the middle of the county is where we have the greatest concentration of cases. But, but it's still everywhere. It's still everywhere. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So moving through some of the data, to me, that's most interesting because, you know, this disease is local. So you look on the left, this is our cases by age group. So most of our cases are in that 25 to 44 year old age group. Um, but when you look at fatalities, it's really when you turn 55 that there is a higher risk for significant morbidity or mortality related to COVID. That is a younger age than the national statistics. The national statistics, it's been more like 65, um, but here in Shelby County, we're seeing 55 as kind of being where there seems to be a real clear dividing line. I find all that stuff just interesting, so I thought I would share it. Um, by race, uh, we are seeing what is being seen all over the country. Um, so if you look on the left, this is the cases by race. So just to give you a point of reference, because um, I was looking at the most recent stats, um, the races in Shelby County is 52% African-American, 40% Caucasian, 
and five to six percent Hispanic or Latino. Um, so you can see here that um, the African American cases are at 57 percent. So there's a disproportionate burden on the African American, but our Hispanic Latino cases are 25 percent. Um, and so that is an even greater uh, disproportionate burden on that community. Um, when you look at fatalities, though, African American fatalities make up 60% of the cases. And the Caucasians are 32%. And then the, the other, which usually the vast majority is going to be Hispanic or Latino, is only 7%. Um, so we see the, you, you got to not only look at where the cases are happening, but also um, where the deaths are happening. And we know that that is because of the um, social determinants of health and the burden of disease that is more prominent in the African-American community when it comes particularly to um, diabetes and hypertension, which we know now that COVID is more of a, um, more of a risk factor for people with cardiac related um, health conditions than necessarily respiratory related health conditions. Um, when we look at the case count, I think, you know, this is kind of stating the obvious because if you keep adding to it, no matter how small a, the jump is, you're going to keep growing the cases. What's more interesting to look at to me is how this breaks out. So the blue bars uh, are the cases that have been recovered. So these are the people who are totally recovered. They're 21 days without symptoms. Um, the black bars are the deaths. I believe, let me make sure I'm saying that right. Yeah, cumulative deceased. Um, and then the yellow bars are the current cases. So they're not closed yet. They're either still symptomatic or they're within 21 days of their um, diagnosis date. And the red bars are just the newly confirmed cases that day. Um, and then the way we look at the way that the cases are increasing um, is the seven day moving average. I think it's real easy to get the, you know, how the news hit over the weekend of the 435 or whatever the case count was that came through. We're trying to get away from the daily reporting out of cases because, you know, we have backlogs and the labs processing the tests and we have big surge testing events that occur. Um, and so that can create kind of a, a, a wave of tests to be resulted, but it doesn't necessarily indicate that we all of a sudden have a crisis when we have 400 positive cases identified. It's because of these, um, the timing of when samples were taken or why they were taken that can oftentimes result in that. So we watch the moving day seven average. So where you're looking, when you see every blue dot, that's representing the average of that day and the seven days before. Now, we still have, obviously, an increasing trend, um, but it's a little bit more easier to follow that trend than a bunch of, you know, ups and downs when you're just looking at each, each date of case count individually. Um, and, and then this is we probably... Have, we do have a question. One, someone yeah. was asking, what was the huge surge on uh, April 24th? They were noticing from your last um, slide, that big spike. Uh, yeah, well, see, and that's what, that is my point, like, that surge, and then you've got these ones over here, um, it could be a backlog, so at one point, AEL is one of the major labs in town, um, they have these two big robotic machines that do their tests, and one of them went down, so it took them three days to fix it, so they had, we had this backlog of tests that were kind of stuck in their lab until they could fix their equipment. That may have been that case, uh, but it, what almost always happens is once you see this big surge, look at the next two days, and they're some of the lowest amounts. So that's why it's just not helpful to look at each individual day because there's so many factors that can impact how many cases are reported on just one day. That doesn't actually have anything to do with, um, you know, kind of public health strategy. So we were looking at that seven day rolling average instead to kind of even that out a little bit. Okay. Um, all right, so then this is the 
I think a more telling one, and this is certainly one that tells us that we've got um, a problem. Um, and this is the, what we've gone to is testing, reporting our weekly testing positivity rate um, with an average for the week. So it's easier to follow, but you can clearly see when we entered phase two is right here um, after 4.5. We were right down at a 4.5% positivity rate, which would mean like out of 100 tests that we run, 4.5% of them are positive. And um, this week, we, we went all the way up to nine, and actually this morning, they reported that last week's uh, test um, positivity rate is 9.8. So we're almost right up at 10, 10 again. And 10 is really the, the cutoff for what we're looking at when you're looking at lots of different measures of how bad, if you will, the infection is. So we're, we're kind of we're back where we started, basically, um, when it comes to the positivity rate. Not when we did the safer at home measures, but when we entered phase one, we're back, we're back where we started. So I don't know, I don't have any insider view as far as what that means, as far as moving to phase three. Um, I do think that we are trying to shift the messaging less so much around phases and more around personal behaviors, because those are really the only tools we have to control this. And in some ways, the phasing of reopening things distracts, um, distracts leadership and pressures leadership um, to make decisions versus talking about what we actually need to be doing to control the infection rate. Okay, so before we, I have like two last slides about where church health is going from here, but are there any questions about um, testing or COVID task force or any of those things that I will do my best to answer them. But do you happen to know if, this is Will again, do you happen to know if there's uh, an, any plans for the task force to help with the return to uh, school as a, as a parent of a school-aged child in the Memphis City school system, yeah. the Shelby County school system? Me too. I uh, have three in the Shelby ah. County school system. Yeah, so actually the superintendents listened in on the call this morning and they're going to start joining. So the superintendents of all the municipalities, uh, the mayors of all the municipalities, along with the um, counties around Shelby County, uh, join in on these calls and they have since the beginning. Uh, there's rep representatives from every hospital system. So um, I believe what we're going to start to do is like the hospitals report out every single time we meet. Um, and then the school systems are going to start to report out and we'll be, you know, trying to problem solve for any barriers they're seeing or things that we can do to help them. Uh, very much focused on getting kids back to school in August um, as one of the key uh, leading kind of strategies, particularly as we move into our next phase of testing. Uh, so once, now that we've got our our community sites all set up and stable. Anybody who's symptomatic and needs a test, there is no excuse to not get a test. There's free testing all over the place. Um, we're really pivoting now to trying to move testing, like mobile testing efforts to places where it's needed most, where we see that there's clusters or hot spots. And how do we work with community groups to get people to get tested? That's I think the hardest part is to get people to get tested. Um, and then working on asymptomatic testing strategies that we believe parents will approve of. Um, and so there's some piloting right now happening with all the YMCA um, childcare for essential workers that in, in trying to just kind of get, try to get that figured out. Um, none of this is cheap. And so figuring out how do we afford all of this and the dilemma with asymptomatic testing, of course, is that it's only good for the moment, right? I mean, you could be exposed the very next day. So what's the right pacing of that? Um, and so probably what it will look like is really focusing in where we have that data from the health department where there's hot spots. So what are the elementary schools in 38118? You know, we're gonna make sure we're testing in those schools um, first. And, and trying to address this um, 
kind of on a population approach than an individual approach. So if you think of all of the children in Shelby County Schools, the last kind of projection I heard, all the children in Shelby County Schools uh, with the rate of asymptomatic um, positive cases that we found, there's probably, there would probably be 300 children who are positive. So that's not a lot when you think of the thousands of children in the school. And so that's, I think, the question we have is, how much testing do we do to try to find those 300? Or does it make more sense to do that kind of testing in the neighborhoods and communities that have a lot of infection spread, so they're more likely to potentially be in that area? And in the rest of the areas, really focusing on cleaning spaces and social distancing and masking of children and you know, uh, maybe hybrid models where they're at school one day or at home one day or whatever it might be. So we can um, cohorting classrooms so they're not you know, all walking around and spreading it to each other. I don't know, it, it's gonna be a challenge to figure out um, you know, what's a reasonable solution. And, and everybody is in 100% agreement that in-person education and instruction is best. Um, but, you know, that may not be possible. We just, we just don't know yet. Yeah. Anything else? There was one more question on the chat. Uh, it has more to do with the requirements for um, uh, services at sure. Church Health. Uh -huh. And Charlotte was asking if uh, you may be looking at or considering accepting 20 volunteer hours uh, in lieu of work hours uh, to uh, achieve eligibility for the services? Yeah, we, we've just decided to, um, to just scrap the working requirement totally. Um, while volunteering definitely is, is always welcomed and accepted, a lot of times, particularly um, with the patients we serve, and, and we were even concerned about this when you hear about Medicaid work requirements, is the documentation, right? The documentation burden that that can place on individuals. Um, and so, you know, we haven't really considered that as being something we would do. We're, we're just going, it's clear, we're clearly in a situation that is um, unique. And so we've changed our uh, entry rules as a result of that. Okay, all right, I'll, anything else? Okay, I will finish up with the last couple of slides, which is just where is church health going from here? So before the pandemic, we actually kind of set our sights on a 10 year horizon, which is to still you know, be in function as a national leader in serving the underserved. So we do, um, we do replication workshops three times a year and have over 40 or so clinics around the country that have started kind of modeled after church health. We know that we have a role as being one of the largest uh, charitable clinics in the country. And so working to, to serve alongside other charitable clinics and lead in that role. Um, we still are focused on the working uninsured. You know, there are very few people who are uninsured who aren't working. I mean, that is just clearly um, where we need to be. We're recognized uh, as a household name in Shelby County, so we need to do more work with that. Um, it always surprises me when people haven't heard of church health, but there are a ton of people who haven't. And so that is really one of our focus points over these next, um, this next decade. In engaging people of faith in our mission um, to offer whole person care and reduce health disparities in our community. Um, the way that we provide care is, is very much an integrated approach where we're paying attention to all the aspects of what makes someone well. And we, we haven't had, I just didn't have time to dig into social determinants of health and all of the lessons we've learned there and our plans to address that and trends in healthcare even around that. So I can come back and do that some other time, but, um, but that is really where we are um, headed. And if anything, I think what I keep reminding the people I talk to with this pandemic is that it has shown a light 
on where there are already disparities. So whether we're talking about our children who couldn't finish up their school year and the digital divide and who has access to the internet and has access to devices, or whether we're talking about access to healthcare and people who literally are not going to the emergency department with COVID symptoms because they don't know how they're gonna pay their bills. Um, whether we are talking about people who won't isolate in quarantine because they can't afford two weeks of not working because their employer doesn't pay sick leave. All of these things I think have just really um, exploded on the scene and, and shown a light on the disparities that our patients deal with all the time and, and they cause stress in their lives and they cause a higher burden of disease. And so we wanna to continue to address that. Um, and so the way that obviously church health needs support to do this work is volunteering, uh, financial support, in-kind supply donation, of course we're, we take that, and then spreading the word, um, helping us become that household name. Um, we are very proud of what we do. We know that, that people would be proud of it too if they knew about it. Um, and one of the easiest ways, and if you can share this with your Rotary Club members, is uh, our champions program spreading the word about church health sharing about our upcoming giving day um, later in july and uh, just helping kind of spread the word about what church health is doing um, the thing that makes us unique is we don't receive the federal funds that fqhcs get to do their services we've literally raised about 60 percent of our budget from memphians um, so we are, a, we are an organization of Memphis, of the people of faith, and um, in the healthcare volunteers and organizations like SCO and, and really coming together with everyone doing their part, we've been able to piece together something I think really special, and we need more people out there telling our story. So would appreciate, um, you know, the Rotary Club helping spread the word. So I appreciate you inviting me here today. And did I see more questions? I think the questions coming in was uh, mainly if we have, if we could have a copy of the slides. Um, yeah. I think people are interested in having this information available. So also hopefully so that we can reference it and share it with our own communities. Um, personally, I just want to thank you for joining us today. Um, I've had a couple of opportunities to, to meet with Jenny in a professional capacity to talk about some vision care items and ideas that we had. And I just want to let you all know that in addition to the amazing uh, depth of her knowledge on topics like this, she also has an amazing breadth of vision. And, um, you know, I come away from each of our meetings amazed at her ability to uh, think bigger and, and, and see opportunities to meet the needs of even more people. And I really just applaud you and the work that you do. And I'm so grateful that you're part of this task force and are willing to share your knowledge with us today. Absolutely. Thanks, Will. And uh, if any of y'all are interested in those data slides <coughs> around COVID, excuse me, I pulled them all off the Shelby County Health Department. So um, I will absolutely send you the slides, but then um, new information will be on there every day. And so if you go to the Shelby County Health Department website, just look for the button that says COVID data dashboard or something, and it'll just take you through all that information. So. Thank you. I'll put a link to that in the chat as well. Okay, great. All right. Good. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Charlotte, you have a question? Oh, if you'll, I'm going to unmute you. Hold on. Hold on, Charlotte. You may have to. There, okay, you go. got it. Yeah. Okay, uh, not really a question. Thank you so much, Jenny. That was very informative. And I took notes so that oh, I can get camping and spread the word. And um, I think one of the things I was thinking about, about the, um, volunteering not necessarily volunteering at church health yeah but just volunteering somewhere in the community and i guess that probably take a whole new position and something else but i was thinking about if you didn't work then you couldn't get services and so where do you go to the emergency room yeah well and so there are other clinics that people can obviously if they're sick or hurt today our walk-in clinic is available for anybody but the ongoing primary care or to access our dental care or our eye clinic, you do need to be established with okay. us. Yeah, um, okay, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, I think what my, 
I mean, Will talking about my vision. I mean, what I would hope that we could do is if someone was uninsured, uh, that we could get to a place where we are helping them create a strategy, a pathway forward for employment, um, for being able to care for themselves and their family. Uh, there's lots of reasons why people are uninsured and we make exceptions all the time. I mean, um, unemployed. They may be caring for a family member, you know, but a, a lot of times that's a temporary situation. And so we do have a social work team and we're actually really excited to be working with Driving the Dream. So United Way has a Driving the Dream program that is a really a intensive um, two generation approach to break the cycle of poverty. Um, and so we are going to be a site for that, but we will be specifically for um, the Hispanic community and trying, because again, um, a lot of these pathways that are available are not available if you don't have a social security number. So we have had to get really inventive and creative over the years for our patients who are not documented uh, to create pathways to get their healthcare needs met when the normal charity pathways don't work. Um, and so United Way needs to do that for their poverty intervention too. Um, and so we're, we're gonna be partnering with them on that to um, see how we can make adjustments. You're amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. What, what are the uh, future plans around the dentistry? given the difficulty of COVID? So um, we, so thankfully we had 24 chairs and we were really only using about 14 of them because we built all this space planning on growing to capacity over time. So we're able to actually use all 24 and spread people out. And we have a section of the clinic that's for um, procedures that uh, create aerosols and a section that's not and our staff is on uh, full N95 PPE all day long. And they, we are back to, uh, by July, we'll be back to 100% capacity in dental um, with, with our pre-COVID levels, which means we're, we're not as efficient because we're using every chair, but um, we're gonna be able to get back and, and treating, completing all of our patient treatment plans. Um, the future for dental, we're really working with UT Dental School to try to create um, faculty and residency clinics within our clinic for their specialties. So we provide all the general dentistry, and this is much like eye care or medicine. We'll do the primary care level stuff. But once you need a root canal, once you need a crown extension, once you need orthodontic work or oral surgery, we need to use volunteers to do that. Um, and that is a, a harder network to build in dentistry. Right. But right. with the dental school, they really need that continuous care of very complicated cases. And so we got that in spades. And so we're able to provide um, you know, solid uh, patient base to train their residents in these specialty procedures um, and make sure that the same resident is seeing the same patient and all the stuff that goes into the logistics of providing continuity care in a training setting. Uh, and it's a win-win. And we get specialty care for our patients that they would otherwise never have access to. And the residents get really good training. So we're hoping to, uh, we have periodontists, uh, faculty residency that's starting up again. And then we'll hope to expand to others as we prove that it's a good placement. That's terrific. So someone in, in, I have a friend who's in a, in a very major poverty situation and he just doesn't do dental care mm -hmm. because he, he hasn't. So I could actually send him there and encourage well, his To company. access our dental services, you do have to be established with us. So I got you. Okay. To be established so patient. He, that's what he told me. He said, no, I think I need to be. And I, for some reason he can't, I haven't figured all that out yet. There may yeah, be we, other Income we should be able, and Christ Community yeah. has a dental clinic too, has several dental clinics. They'd be another option for him as well. I'm going to yeah. tell him pursue it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Encourage. Thank you.
Thank you again, Jenny. And thank you all for coming out tonight again. I appreciate y'all joining us in this format and we'll continue in the future. Is there any other club business before we sign off? Mike, you want to put your microphone on? I can't hear you. If you could, I think you're there I got you it. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Um, I witnessed the induction of the club president at our sister club in Howe Bay, South Africa. They send their regards to all of us. Um, they're faced with many of the same things that we are. And it's a pleasure. They just had their first pass off between a husband and wife team. And they're looking to have a very good year and they wish us the same. That's it. That's great. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. And Charlotte? Uh, uh, just a reminder, on July 7th, we'll have Jeff Lias from the TVA. So have your questions ready so we can have a balanced presentation with him versus uh, Paul. And on July 21st, we'll have Bill Gibbons from the Crime Commission, from the Shelby County Crime Commission. So tell all your friends, tell all your loved ones, tell all the members, and so we can have a great group and a great turnout for all of our events. And Jenny, we invite you to come also. Thank you. That's great. All right. Oh, one other thing. Thank you, Brian, for bringing no Jenny. No problem. Thank you, really, Brian. Thanks, thanks yeah. for being here. I'll see y'all uh, next time for sure. Right. We're delighted. Thank y'all very much. Have a great night. Thank you. Have, have a great one. Thank you. Rotary International Convention is online, free online. Oh, thank oh, you, Shirley. Good. Yes, absolutely correct. If you haven't gotten those emails, uh, let me know. I'll be happy to send you 18 of them because I get them every day. <laughs> right. That's great. Take it. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Shirley. Bye, y'all. Thanks, guys. See you, Will. Thanks, Denise. Did Charlotte leave? I think Charlotte did leave. Do you need her cell number? No. And were we supposed to stay? I don't well, think am so. I supposed to stay? No. Oh no, I don't think so. Um, I wanted to tell you, Cheryl, actually if you if you'll stay for just a second, let me stop the recording.